Welcome to the Geriatric Education Center of Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center. We hope that you enjoy our series of web-based training modules and continue to return to our website to meet your training needs. This program is supported in part by federal grant funds from the Bureau of Health Professions, HRSA, DHHS, and USPHS. Today's program is Dementia versus Delirium. Diagnosis makes a difference, sometimes. The content was provided by Dr. Mike Reagan in the Department of Family Medicine. He is the Chair of Family and Community Medicine in Lubbock at our Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center campus there. This presentation was given as a part of the Intern Survivor Series and is Our objectives today are to recognize delirium and dementia, to describe the difference between delirium and dementia, and to effectively manage patients with delirium or dementia. During this training, you will be asked to review cases in which you will decide whether the patient is experiencing dementia, delirium, depression, or a combination of the three. The patient experiencing agitation and the nurse wants something to sedate the patient. You are cross-covering and the note states that the patient was admitted for CHF exacerbation. Nothing else is significant on the checkout sheet. What is going on with this patient and or what would you do? The patient could be in pain. It could be drugs. What about her age? It could be a new symptom and she's trying to get the nurse's attention. This could also be her baseline. Would you see these problems in, say, a 15-year-old? No, not very often. Most likely, you will see these in an emergency room or inpatient setting and the patient will be elderly. We need to differentiate if it is a baseline feature, as in dementia, or delirium, and just as a side note, dementia is called a progressive cognitive decline, particularly in memory. With dementia, there also has to be another cognitive defect, such as problems with attention, orientation, changes in personality, judgment, or abstract thinking. With delirium, there is a fluctuating level of consciousness. Let's look at our case, second case. We have a 60-year-old female who brings her husband in and says, he's forgetting everything. He's confused, he forgets everything, and I don't feel safe leaving him alone. The final straw for the wife was when he went off to the store and got lost in his own hometown where he's been driving for 60 years. What do you suspect here? Dementia, right? More of the long-term progressive situation. There is a small pearl here, too. If someone comes in and reports that they themselves are having memory loss, it's probably not memory loss or dementia. If someone else brings them in and says that there are memory problems, it probably is dementia. We will talk about some of the differentials. So. Okay, so dementia, it's rare under the age of 50. If you look at the 85 and older population, 48% of those persons will have dementia. So it's much more common, and age definitely plays into it. You have to think about that when you're doing your assessment. That first case, the 78-year-old, we have to be thinking that there may be some underlying dementia. They can, of course, coexist, and dementia is a risk factor for delirium, so they are not necessarily mutually exclusive. Here are some risk factors. The older you get, the more common it is. Folks with Down syndrome, someone with head injury, for instance, from a motor vehicle accident, um, sports players, um, all have a definitely higher risk of dementia. Also, the fewer years of education, the higher the risk. So higher educational levels are a protective feature. 
Sometimes symptoms can show up later, or maybe it will come out as MCI, or mild cognitive impairment. It's more common in females, and there are some genetic factors. Let's discuss genetics. In early onset dementia, there is mutation in chromosomes 1, 14, and 21. In late onset dementia, which is most common, the mutations occur in chromosome 19. On chromosome 19, there is an apolipoprotein E. If you're familiar with that, you can actually test for this. It's a genotype with three alleles, APO2, 3, and 4. If you have 4, 4, this is bad news. It's the highest risk, but only 3% of the population has this. The next highest risk, if you have one copy of the 4. There may be some protection if you have a 2. So you can do genotyping and see the risk of your patient, and maybe you might become more aggressive in treating some of the cardiovascular risk factors that are also factors for dementia. The good news is, whether or not you have APOE4 allele, it is not necessary or sufficient to cause dementia. So what are the causes of dementia? Alzheimer's disease is very well known. There is also stroke, Pick's disease, Huntington's, Down syndrome, Creutzfeldt-Jakob, or CJ, AIDS, alcoholism, and Parkinson's, with Parkinson's Lewy body dementia is more common, and other neurodegenerative disorders and some indeterminate causes. So there are a lot of things out there, and they tend to look fairly similar, but there are some differences. Let's get back to dementia. Frontotemporal lobe dementia is most commonly associated with behavioral problems. So this is a tip-off if you see a more prominent behavioral piece. Vascular dementia is where you will see a stepwise progression in the disease. For instance, a decline in cognition may be indicative of a stressful situation. Maybe the patient experienced a heart failure exacerbation. Maybe there was an illness. And due to these stressors, you will see a decline in cognition each time a stressful event takes place. Lewy body dementia is most commonly associated with Parkinson's disease. Let's not forget about pseudodementia. This is depression showing up as memory problems. When people get older, those big life stressors happen. The death of a spouse, a change of job, or even retirement, a change in living situation. It's these stressors that can lead to depressive symptoms. So what characteristics need to be present for a diagnosis of dementia? For a diagnosis of dementia, they have to have memory loss tip in both short-term and long-term memory, although short-term may be more prominent and earlier. Plus, they have to have one or more cognitive defects. This is what we forget about sometimes. You have memory loss and a language problem or organizational problem, object recognition, naming things, and disturbed or disturbed executive function. This can also mean a change in personality or inhibition. So why do we want to diagnose dementia? First of all, we would want to find treatable conditions such as medication toxicity, as in benzodiazepines or H2 blockers, for example, or thyroid disease. We may also find treatable symptoms and comorbidities like depression, delirium, delusions, or agitation. Thirdly, if we do conclude that the patient has dementia, we need to identify caregivers so that they can plan. And fourth, we would want to modify living arrangements and or the environment. Let's review a quick case. Let's say that you have a husband and wife that live together 
and the husband passes away due to coronary artery disease. He has been helping her along at home, and you see this a lot in spouses and or family members that help their loved one continue to exist in the home environment. With the passing of the husband, suddenly this, this assistance has changed. What happens? What is the greatest risk factor? That is correct. Safety is the biggest risk. A person could set the kitchen on fire or they could get lost. So safety is the biggest issue. And as a diagnostician, we need to pick up on that. And it's amazing how well patients can cover up their defects. For example, maybe you have a grandmother that comes in with her grandchildren and she's doting on her grandchildren. But if you ask her what their names are, she wouldn't be able to recall. So again, in patients that you suspect of having dementia, you will need to go looking for it and definitely look for things that can be reversed. For caregivers, this is very important. There is tremendous guilt the family experiences if they have to use a nursing home setting. And there will also be an attempt by the family to extend the independence of their loved one, which at that time is appropriate but it can be challenging, so there are a few reasons to diagnose. There are some critical components in the dementia assessment. It is critical for you to get a history, and it is important not to depend on only the patient for that history. You may also ask a child, an adult child, or a neighbor, or a spouse. It is important to get a broad history to get a feel. And again, in early dementia, these patients can fool you. So you want to do a focused physical exam, a mini mental status exam, or other screening instrument that you choose, and lab work. In looking for things that can make a difference, you can do a workup on coexisting kidney disease or liver disease, also calcium, looking for hypercalcemia and thyroid disease. You may also want to check B12 and folate, as this is another route to the disorder for the patient. So, you'll need some type of laboratory and some type of brain imaging. Brain imaging would be more helpful if there is a detailed H&P.